Hello and welcome back to AmbiV. I'm Casper and today we're going to be trying out a GoPro Hero Max for some 360 video recording while driving the 04 Viper. So in today's video, I just really wanted to do something quick to test out the 3D recording capacity of the Hero Max. Now this is a 360 camera, which means it has a forward and rearward facing 180 degree camera lens, which then is stitched together into a 360 video. Now, I know that this is going to take some additional editing, which is why I have brought along my lavalier mic, my Rhodes wireless lavalier mic recording to an H4n for second audio source. And I know this because I've already recorded this video once and the audio failed partway through, so I had nothing to work with. Now, the camera does have microphones, but the camera microphones sound like this. Not exactly something you would want to be listening to for an entire video. So now that we've got the audio discussion out of the way, let's talk about why I'm even trying out a Hero Max. So the Hero Max really is only a benefit if you're doing something where you're recording 3D video, or three, not 3D, but 360 VR. So there's two versions of this video that will be released. A version in which I will allow you to have control of it as an actual YouTube VR video. If you're on your computer, you can click and drag your mouse to look around, or if you're on your phone, you can just move the phone around and look around. Either way. Now, the reason I'm doing this really is to find out if I can get away with having a single forward-facing and rearward-facing camera to record driving videos. Typically, my driving videos require two to three cameras and a second set of audio just to be able to do a basic video because it's just purely boring only being able to look at me while I'm talking and I need a better perspective to see out the windshield. With the 360 cameras like this Hero Max, I have the ability to record both simultaneously. In the VR version, you can look around, but in the non-VR version, when I edit it in Premiere, I can set where the camera perspective is. So I can move the camera around as if I'm setting up or staging shots on the fly. It's really pretty nice if this all works out. Now, as I said, I've tried this video once. I got partway through and realized that I had no audio and had to scrap the whole thing. During that recording, lots of interesting things happened. I almost ran over like 30 squirrels. I almost hit a flock of turkeys. I mean, there was all kinds of things going on and all of it was useless. So today I'm gonna go drive the kind of curvy road that's not too far away here and talk about some of the things I like and dislike about the Viper while we just generally see how well the video turns out. Now, the 2004 Viper is still pretty new to me. I haven't got a lot of seat time. I've been driving it here and there on random errands and things, but I haven't had a chance to take it to an autocross or to a track day. And ultimately, I don't even know if I'll be allowed to on this car. I'll have to see how high my helmet is. Most track days require the broomstick test where they find out if a broomstick can touch your helmet when going from the top of your windscreen to behind your seat. And I don't know if this will pass. Now, this car is one of those cars that has a reputation for being completely terrifying to drive. It's supposedly uh, a axe murderer of wheels. Everybody's gonna die. Almost all of them were crashed within the first 20 miles of ownership or something like that. I have to say, so far, this is actually one of the easiest cars I have to drive. Now, I do have a few things that I think may lend themselves toward that reputation. So let's talk about that first. The first would be that I think it's deceptive when providing you with a sensation of speed. Now what I mean by that is the long sweeping hood combined with incredibly tall gearing and 500 horsepower results in a situation where you can be in a gear at low RPM and have the visual appearance that you are barely moving but actually be doing double the speed you think you are. So for instance, you can get off of a freeway on-ramp in fourth gear and actually be doing 80 when it sounds like and feels like you're doing 40. That could definitely lend itself 
to biting some inexperienced drivers. Additionally, the car doesn't have traction control or stability control. So if you get yourself into a problem, you're just in that problem. You're not getting out of that. Now, here I'm at 1500 RPM at the speed limit for a rural road in fourth gear. That's ridiculous. And that's the other part of this whole equation. It doesn't sound like you're going fast and it's because of how tall the rear end is. Now, that's something I'm going to be remedying shortly. I'm going to be replacing the gear set in the rear end of this car with 355s to try to make it a little more lively, a little bit more punchy on acceleration, but also let me actually use my gears. Right now, it feels like I have three gears and three overdrives, which is ridiculous. Now, if you get past the basic things that would bite a inexperienced or generally poor driver, this car isn't hard to drive and is actually great. It's very comfortable, the controls are very easy to use. The steering is a little bit darty compared to what you may be used to in another car, but that's because it has such large front tires, the turn in is a little bit aggressive. But the steering is very light, or at least very easy. It does have some heft to it, which is nice. It makes you feel like you're doing something. And the gear shift is very clear, precise, and a little bit heavier. The clutch is actually really light compared to what I was expecting. But overall, I think just about anyone could drive one of these cars pretty easily. Now, another component to this is that the car has a very high level of mechanical grip with these massive tires. I would say this car has more grip than pretty much any of my other cars, even things that have, in some cases, pretty aggressive rubber on them. And that leads you to a situation where you can get yourself into quite a lot of trouble if you come into corners like this, where there's gravel on them, at a very high rate of speed, expecting your mechanical grip to be there. Now, that's not really the car's fault, that's your fault. That's no different than driving on slicks and getting caught in a downpour. You're gonna have problems if you don't plan ahead and drive according to your conditions. Now on this back road, I could be flying along for most part in most of these corners, but I don't know what's around the corner. I don't know if there's gravel. I don't know if there's a bicyclist, a herd of turkeys. I don't know what's gonna be around the corner. And I've seen all of those things. So I'm going to drive well within my capacity to stop should something unexpected pop up. And that's really the biggest problem most people are gonna have with this car. It really does kind of encourage you to drive a little bit like a lunatic. And if you give in and do such a thing, you're probably running the risk of a pretty good crash because when you do crash, it's going to be at a very high rate of speed. Now, even though this is 500 horsepower, I don't think one of the biggest threats is losing the back end unless you do something incredibly stupid. This car seems very, very planted. And really, the way the throttle comes on almost makes it feel like it has a little bit of an eccentric throttle pulley. There's almost nothing down low when you start to dip into it. So unless you really stab it, you're not just instantaneously spinning the tires. My Mustang has a much more aggressive throttle uh, engagement. At the very beginning of the throttle, you start to have like a massive engagement of the butterfly in the throttle body. And that leads to kind of a punchy feel. Now, mostly since I'm just testing the camera, I don't want to get into too much conversation about the, the Viper, especially in comparison to other cars. But I will say, for a car that I hadn't driven hardly at all before buying one, I'm really pretty pleased with the purchase. Some people would say I should have bought a Gen 4, Gen 5 Viper. You should have got a, a, the newest generation ACR. But this car is fully depreciated and I can enjoy it. I can take it out here, drive it, have fun with it. And it has 15,000 miles on it. It's basically a new car that I won't lose money in depreciation on and I don't have to feel bad about driving. Not to mention, I picked it up for almost 30% what it would have been sticker. So that's a pretty good savings and a lot of enjoyment to be had. I always rate my cars on smile per gallon and smile per dollar. And it's one of the reasons why I'm not a huge fan of hyper exotics like Lamborghinis or Ferraris. The smile per dollar just really isn't there for me. I could sell a few of my cars and get one, 
but this car does pretty much what I want. It's also not ridiculously over the top to where it will cause me problems when I'm trying to maintain it in the future. I don't have to go to some crazy exotic dealership or ship my car halfway across the country for service. Now, there's a lot more I'd like to talk about on this car or talk about fun cars in general in one of my future videos, but I think I'll go ahead and leave this one here for right now. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them in the section down below. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next video.